<laughs> yay to the chair folks. So I want to start a little bit by kind of getting a level set sense of where you think we are in enterprise settings with cloud infrastructure. Like, what percentage of workloads are people running in the cloud? And maybe, Lachlan, if you guys want to start as the sort of user in the bunch here. Uh, so we're running a large percentage of our production infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, and it's our strategy to actually move all of it in there. So going forward, we see tr tremendous value. So while we're still moving there, uh, you know, the, the sky's the limit for us. Um, it's a little weird to see myself staring at me over there. But, <laughs> good um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, I think that right now we've been talking about uh, the cloud disruption and data center operating systems for a very long time, and uh, because of that, there is this kind of notion in the air that uh, um, the kind of the, the, the things have established themselves and uh, kind of the players are who they are going to be. Um, and Amazon is this undisputed leader of public cloud and things like that. But uh, my perception is that uh, um, right now we are maybe uh, like 5% into the journey. And uh, just to put things in perspective, you know, everybody's talking about the spectacular revenue that uh, Amazon Web Services um, has right now and is projecting into the future. Uh, but if you think of it in terms of the size of the market that they are disrupting, it's really just a sliver of everything because uh, the, size of the, uh, uh, the, the, the size of the application infrastructure software market is uh, somewhere around 26 billion, not so much. But uh, when we're looking about, talking about cloud and Amazon specifically, it's not just the software that's getting disrupted, it's the hardware, uh, the IT infrastructure hardware that's getting disrupted as well, right? And uh, right now, Amazon is around six billion in revenue, but uh, the uh, IT infrastructure hardware market, worldwide market, is over a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. So uh, the market that's being disrupted is a trillion plus. The players, the most successful ones that are disrupting it today, are in single digit billions. So that kind of gives you a perspective of where we are and how far we are into this journey, in my opinion. So you think we're not settled yet, even though we, we talked this morning about this sort of OpenStack is the fifth player, right? Three yeah, public think, clouds and VMware. I and think, I think that there is a bunch of players, both in the public cloud space and the private cloud space, that have solved different bits and pieces of a puzzle. Uh, but we are still very early in the, in the market. And a lot of the ones that you perceive today as V leaders, um, I'm convinced will probably perish and other leaders will emerge. There's going to be a lot of dynamic in this market. Still you want to make bets on which of the ones you're talking about are going to perish? <laughs> I, I, I don't want to make any projections. I'm, I've been okay. burned for that, but okay. I can, we, can, we can guess. <laughs> Alex, do you agree that we're still very early? And yeah, we, I think we on see public cloud, I think most, I'd say the bulk of comp like, I don't know, Fortune 500 and so on have tried cloud in a way that if they're going to anytime soon, there's probably a number of them that have just written it off completely, at least, or at least around public cloud. Um, I think private cloud, it's, it's a little bit still more greenfield. There's, it reminds me a lot of uh, <laughs> kind of, oh, I don't know. But anyway, I'm not going to go there. But the, oh. um, I think that, that on public cloud, the folks that are going to try it have already tried it or have tried it a little bit yep. and done it. And then companies in their own environments, the ones that are still holding out is because their infrastructure is so old and legacy that it's like a pretty big effort to rewrite. But I think the kind of the market and everything is ready for, for it. Like, you know, the IT departments all have their budgets back now and like are ready for the new initiatives and people are trying to do more and go faster. So like now's the time okay. to go for it. Okay, so now that we're kind of on the cusp of maybe big adoption, what have you seen enterprise customers doing right? And what have you seen them doing wrong when they start doing cloud projects in a, in a serious way? And again, I'm gonna start with the, the user in the group. What did, what did Lithium do right and what did you guys do wrong when, uh, when you started on your cloud path? So I think one thing we did right was really understanding our use case and what problem we're trying to solve by introducing private and public cloud uh, solutions. So we had a fairly good understanding initially on what we were trying to solve. So I think that set us up for success. Uh, we knew what, what it was to deliver. Um, what I see when I, when I look at the, uh, at the failure stories is that, you know, not understanding the, the, their, you know, a solution in search of a problem. 
uh, rather than the other way around. So, you know, it's, if, you, if you pull back from cloud, it's really what are you delivering with cloud? And it's you're enabling your development team to uh, provision resources and run applications um, and get things out of their mind into environments much faster. So that's really what the cloud enables us to do, is, is self-service infrastructure. Um, and, and in your case, if you can be specific, what was the sort of problem that you were trying to solve for in, in the beginning? I, I think it was, a, you know, a, the, the, the market has gone, you know, the operation side and the development side. So there used to be a wall, you know, a, maybe it's just a figure of speech, but having uh, you know, operations and, and development work closer together to provide solutions rather than having an operations team dedicated to keeping the apps up. Um, and, and, you know, it, it provided a better and more stable environment when developers actually understood how the applications were deployed as well. So. Okay. And, and Alex, what do you think? Again, what do you see common threads what, when enterprise do things right and when they do things wrong? I think that uh, from what I've seen, the common problem is that uh, organizations tend to uh, overestimate the uh, uh, complexity of the technology problem and underestimate the complexity of the process problem. Um, because um, you know, a lot of the folks that you know, they, they implement the cloud as like a VMware cloud or they start doing something with Amazon um, and um, Basically, the, and they don't see the results that they wanted to, and it's not so much because uh, the technology is not delivering, but because the organizational process hasn't changed, right? If, you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you're using Amazon, but uh, if to use Amazon, you still need to call your IT department and tell them how many VMs you need and uh, you know, do the budgeting thing and all the stuff, and then a month later, you get your access, that kind of defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've seen, I think, that actually uh, lithium or kind of trailblazers here is that uh, um, Amazon is a really good thing for us um, and it's a good thing for OpenStack because uh, oftentimes um, organizations would go to public cloud um, and they'll start adopting public cloud. It'll take them some years to actually adjust the process um, and start getting comfortable with the uh, cloud consumption model and once the cloud consumption model is something that is natural for the organization, you can already start thinking about solving the technology problem, right? So you go with the uh, place where the technology problem is solved, arguably, you know, AWS, then that pulls the solutions around the process, and then, okay, now that's done, you can start saying, okay, let's augment that with an in-house OpenStack cloud, or maybe start using, you know, VMware cloud, or start using all these things. And do you, do you agree with that, Alex? Do you see that a public cloud can be the sort of baby step yeah, no, that... absolutely, absolutely. So for us, we absolutely see ourselves being more successful in the accounts, uh, enterprise accounts that are familiar with the cloud model and that have been using a public cloud in the past yeah. and are now actually complementing the public cloud story with some sort of private cloud story and, versus and, the opposite. And CoreOS, so you guys see the same thing in your yeah, user think, base? And... I think no, nobody really, nobody wants vendor lock-in, you know, and, and the way kind of all the APIs are done and everything now, it, you kind of have to pick your camp. Like, if you're going to really program against the clouds directly and really deeply integrate with them, I think the way, you know, we're seeing companies get away from vendor lock-in is really not actually bet too hard on the APIs themselves and be like, okay, I got my server running now, I'm gonna go back to my like server way of running my infrastructure right. versus um, you know, going into the deeper tools that the cloud providers have because you can't really get those anywhere. Um, but even in the long game with, with Amazon, we see their stuff getting more and more adopted, like the more exotic services that they have, like DynamoDB and stuff like that, like running into those things more and more, which I think is a threat to all of this kind of stuff because th those, those solutions just don't exist um, outside of Amazon. I would actually be curious if I can see a show of hands in the room, how many people here are running production workloads in, a, in, a, in AWS, or at least believe that they're... Okay, that's not not everybody as I thought it would be. I guess this is a self-selected group. I, I guess how many have tr how many have used AWS? <laughs> yes, it's up for. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. That should have been my question. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And and then how do you decide? How do you tell uh, particularly enterprise customers who are getting started? How do you tell them uh, what to run in public cloud, what to run in an OpenStack or other private cloud environment, and what to run in kind of closed infrastructure? Yeah, that's tough. I guess it's all just it depends on what you're, what you care about. You know, if you don't. 
care about data residency or any sort of regulatory issues or, you know, or, or if you don't, if you care about OpEx instead of CapEx, I mean, it just kind of depends um, where, where you put it, if you care about lock-in, yeah. I don't know. Do you guys have any advice the, on the Maranta side for your customers what to run in public, private, hybrid? Um, I think I would agree with Alex that it's very kind of use case specific. Um, I mean, to be honest, um, I, my, my view is that the public cloud right now is, is in general more mature and more robust than the private cloud. I mean, that's just unfortunately the fact. Um, at the same time, um, it is potentially more expensive than, than the public cloud that, that you can, than private cloud that you can implement. So uh, what, what we've seen kind of uh, uh, people do is uh, um, focus their private cloud efforts on uh, um, empowering their internal engineering teams to do all kinds of things pre-production and then post-production um, already moving things to the public cloud. And I know like we're all talking about production stuff on OpenStack, so I'm being a little bit anti-OpenStack, I guess, <laughs> in my comments here. But uh, I mean, that's generally the truth. But uh, I think that the flip side of a coin, though, is that uh, um, it's true, and again, this is to Alex's point, is that uh, you know, as we're moving to this notion of uh, DevOps and uh, people programming directly against infrastructure APIs, um, you're moving into this paradigm where the uh, applications are getting much closer coupled to the infrastructure. And uh, the long-term view for everybody, and I think, again, Lithium can support that, is that you, don't, you, wanna, you wanna have some sort of air gap. You wanna have some sort of control, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to have all of your applications talking exclusively to AWS APIs, all your data be in the AWS, right? So um, um, with this kind of the long-term view, I think where the uh, open solutions and some sort of fabric that ultimately is controlled by you to some extent, that uh, talks to the different infrastructure pools is a, is a more sound solution for all workloads, period. Okay, Lachlan, uh, I want you to, you raised your hand on the AWS question, so I wanna ask you, how do you decide kind of what you run in public cloud and private cloud? Yeah. And then I just wanna uh, get people ready for a couple questions if sure. there are uh, I, folks I in the room. I mean, data residency sh sh certainly plays in. Uh, it's about providing consistency as well across platforms. So if we're using the public cloud, can we provide a consistent experience in the, in the private cloud or in the data infrastructure that we own. Um, you know, an, another thing is reach. So, you know, when we have customers in different geographical locations, it's easier to go to a public cloud and say, please provide something there rather than us go and build a data center there. So, you know, when we're actually looking at workloads, a lot of that comes into play is, do I need to run this, uh, you know, only in the United States or do I need to run it in China? Do I need to run it in Brazil? Um, where are my customers? Who's using it? So the public cloud gives you the reach, and the, the private cloud gives us a consistent experience across the infrastructure platform. Okay, and I just wanna see if we have any questions. Oh, there's one up here, I don't know where the microphone is. Gentleman in a checked shirt. Okay, well, I, I can hear you, and then I will translate it if need be. My voice carries That's right. Right, and for people who didn't hear, it was sort of the culture change question that was a, an issue that Boris brought up. I think that there is some element of that. Um, I think that the process change is substantially a bigger hurdle because, uh, I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, this, this notion of move to the cloud is uh, developer-fueled, and uh, uh, the developers, they just want to have access to infrastructure faster, that's self-service, and that culture is already there and that culture is, to some extent, what propelling adoption of cloud. But when it comes to, uh, I guess, the IT culture and IT management culture, then yes, there, there has to be some culture change, right? I mean, there's, there's definitely hurdles to be overcome um, around IT and the organizations getting comfortable with public cloud not being this enemy, or cloud in general being this enemy where you potentially lose control and you just you know, let your developers loose on this. Um, so, um, there is some element of culture change on the IT side. What about at CoreOS? Do you guys have a point of view on this kind of 
process and culture shift. Quite. Yeah, I mean, we're all about change. We're like changing everything on everyone. And, and so <laughs> it, uh, it's kind of confusing um, for folks. But I think the role of like a sysadmin or operations person does not go away by any means. Like there's still a role within a company that is about how do I take the business workloads that we need to run and translate them into running on top of infrastructure in a resilient and highly available way. And that role is still very important. The things that are changing quite a bit are like from our perspective are when there's that Linux kernel security vulnerability, we just think software can patch that for you automatically. Or when your monitor that's like monitoring the web app and it notices like the thing isn't running anymore, we think a program can like start that thing back up again for you versus like waking you up in the middle of the night to go have to start it and so on. So it's using software to do some of the like basic rudimentary stuff that we probably should have had software do a long time ago, but that still is change because there's a lot of you know operations guys out there that identify with keeping their server infrastructure up to date and that's like what they're focused on and want to make sure they're yeah. doing for the best of the company. And our argument is that, that that's something that can be done kind of more generically for everyone. So it is a challenge, and, and these are the sorts of things where we have discussions a little bit more top down, and that we're, we're able to say, hey, look, with your existing operations teams, we're going to help them run more server infrastructure by taking care of a lot of the nuts and bolts for them in software, um, instead of having to grow your infrastructure teams you know, with growing the size of your server server workload. And that's why the, the hyperscale guys already doing it this way, because they, with the number of servers they have, they couldn't possibly um, hire a big enough operations team to do it the more classic enterprise way. Um, so anyway, the, my point is, yes, there's change. Um, it's not non-trivial. I think our challenge as a software vendor is to help, you know, help companies embrace that change, um, not resist it. And how did you guys deal with this, Lachlan, at Lithium? Did you have people who said, my job is to ba manage servers? What the hell am I supposed to do now? Uh, yes, uh, I want to speak to that, the question the gentleman asked. Uh, so, you know, how we did it, we, we faced the, the process problem. And what we actually did was, uh, you know, went and identified Lighthouse engineering customers and made them successful in the cloud space. And, you know, it was kind of a path of least resistance story where, you know, look what it would take to run this on bare metal. You know, rec requisition for hardware, which takes six weeks spinning up a server, getting it handed over, and then uh, you know, handing it over to the ops team, or we can have it in several minutes um, with the click of a button. And you know, automating the whole tool chain uh, so that de developers could write features and get them out into environments really quickly. So once we started enabling specific uh, applications with inside the company, you know, everybody else said, I want to be on this because I see the value in getting that time to market down and delivering features much faster. So it kind of, it, you know, we had ambassadors and, and the rest of the culture followed. So that's, that's the model we used. Okay, that's really interesting. All right, so we're the only thing standing between these people and lunch. So um, with that, we're going right to... There have been aching to ask Oh, no, I, I think we're going to have to, um, I guess we'll take one more and then we'll let people run away, wherever uh, then. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Joe's cutting us off. <laughs> no more. <laughs> Go ahead. If it's you, Alex, you okay. can ask a question. I'll ask it then. Um, I'm curious of what you, where you see OpenStack as an application development platform. What, what are the gaps? Um, where is it on the maturity scale? And, and for people who didn't hear, uh, the question was about <laughs> OpenStack as an application platform. Well, um, that's a loaded question. So. Um, it depends. So it depends on what you mean by the application development, right? So some people see like application development platform as something as like a platform as a service, right? There's a developers who want to operate a higher level of abstraction. Um, so OpenStack is nowhere near there, right? OpenStack is at this point all about infrastructure pools. Um, and um, also when it comes to uh, you know the so solving some of the hard problems. Um, OpenStack is really kind of like a, a framework where you need to put together different solutions to the hard problems and glue them together with OpenStack mm -hmm. uh, for it to become a development platform. So um, I think that uh, um, there is a lot of spot gaps um, at the bottom of the stack and a whole bunch, and there's nothing, not, nothing's been, been started as far as the platform as a service stuff is concerned. So, but then again, it's like, OpenStack is slightly different from just being a developer platform per se. It's a, it's a way to build a developer platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at it that way, then um, really 
the gaps are few. If you look at just OpenStack in and of itself, and you get rid of like, you know, the OpenStack doesn't have a native SDN, OpenStack does not have native, you know, software-defined storage, you have to plug stuff in, then it's just kind of a framework for building a platform out. 